just directing your pizza to Daddy Green's Pizza. Welcome back to Bad Movies Rule, your worst podcast about films. This show, as you know, is trash, and today we're talking about a barn burner, people. The 1985 classic, The Last Dragon. Barry Gordy's Last Dragon. <laughs> is that technically part of the title? I believe so. When you're watching the it movie, is. it starts out and then it sort of dissipates and then it just says The Last oh, Dragon. Geez. Sorry, Barry. Who's Barry anyway? Because Barry's Barry Gordy. not. Yeah. Who is he? Uh, he? He founded Motown Records. Oh, did he? Oh, See, yeah. I just showed how, how ignorant I am in the ways of music because I'm, I'm not like a big music guy. I'm looking at my sheet and I'm like, okay, he didn't direct it. He didn't write it. Who's Barry Gordy, Gordy and why is he? I love my music much like I love my movies. I have no idea who's and what, who's who. <laughs> I just show up to enjoy. I, I think if we were this age in 1985, we'd be all over this movie. And be like, oh, Barry Gordy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Right. I didn't. I mean, we were alive in 1985, but I was six years old and I didn't know who any of these people were. Well, I'm happy that you guys are here listening today, and as you heard, we're talking about The Last Dragon, and so joining us today, we've got Mr. Kurt Mummer. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you guys? I'm fantastic, man. This is like two or three in a row for you, I feel like. Yeah, I've been really kind of knuckling down and enjoying <laughs> getting in here with you guys. That's awesome, man. And uh, joining us also is uh, Brady Cox, all the way from Omaha, Nebraska. Brady, how's this morning treating you? Uh, fairly well. Excellent. Yes, thank you for asking. Excellent. We're talking about The Last Dragon, which was one of Brady's draft picks. So, yes. I'm, you know, how excited are you that we're talking about this movie this morning? Um, as excited as you're going to ever hear me. Oh, <laughs> I can tell. I can just tell by your voice. It's just seeping through the speakers. He's one mellow right? fellow. <laughs> I, I am very happy. Like, I love this movie, and I love that both of you had never seen it before. Yeah, we Kurt and I got to watch this together, which yes. isn't normally what happens because we normally just watch these on our own. But it worked out this week. We got to watch this together. Neither of us had seen it, and that oh. was a blast. Yeah, absolutely. I had I had nothing but good times. And and then you watched it again. I heard. Yeah, I did. My my. <laughs> so my daughter was so excited that you were coming over the other night. She wanted mm. to hang out with us, mm. but obviously. Being four, you're you're <laughs> off the walls, bouncing around, want to mm -hmm. entertain. Yeah. So it would have been more of us hanging out with her instead of watching the movie. Right. So I made sure that I spent some time with her last night rewatching the movie. That means you subjected yourself to this movie twice in 48 hours. Correct. All yes. right. Yes. That's incredible. But was it? Her favorite movie of all time? Like, did it replace Winnie the Pooh or Batman or whatever she's no, into? No, Batman <laughs> is by far her number one. She okay. will always, nothing beats Batman. So if Batman and the Last Dragon were in a fight, she'd be cheering for Batman. Absolutely. She would much rather see them team up. She actually right. made a mention of that last Oh, night. she gets upset when people fight? No, it's just more <laughs> she thinks she'd make a good Batman sidekick. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> Leroy Green was Robin. That'd be awesome. Hey, I, I'd vote for that. Well, let's get some of the vitals out of the way. This movie was directed by Michael Schultz. Now, Michael Schultz from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, people. Woohoo! Yeah, local boy. And he, not like a lot of directors that once they make a movie that appears on our podcast, their career ends. He actually went on <laughs> to have a pretty good career. Again, Something that I've also noticed is a common thread. The people whose careers don't end tend to shift towards television after making a couple of these movies. And that is what happened. He made a handful of movies and then he shifted into TV. And he's directed tons of TV, so very successful in that in that respect. And uh, he also, uh, there's a couple other movies he made that I actually knew. Have any of you guys ever seen Car Wash? No. 1976? Oh, it's been a very long time since I've seen it, but... Yeah, like in the 80s, I've seen it. Yeah. But you're aware of it, right? And then there's another movie yeah. that I think belongs probably on our list for our next draft from 1987, which was two years after this. He made Disorderlies with the Fat Boys. Did you guys oh, ever see I, that? I wanted to add that to the list, but you can't stream it anywhere. Oh, you can't find it? No, I, I can't no find idea. it. I've never okay. even heard of that movie. Well, I'll have to see yeah, if I, I can... tried to watch it 
a while ago. I mean, the Fat Boys mm-hmm. were definitely a thing of the eighties. That yeah. I mean, I remember seeing it. I don't remember. I I mean, very. I like a few frames of the movie is what I remember, like mm-hmm. images, because I saw it once a long time ago. But I'll see if I can hunt that down and get that added, to, like at least a copy of it, and we can add it to the list. Because we got to have another Michael Schultz movie after what I witnessed the other night when I saw this movie. Yeah, absolutely. Movie was written by Louis Van Osta. I think that's how you say it, Van Osta. And uh, the only other thing he really, I mean, he wrote a couple other things. This is not to denigrate his work, but the only other thing he wrote that I recognized was Bird on a Wire, which was a Mel Gibson, Goldie Hawn movie, 1990. And that was kind of it for him. And then the movie starred a lot of people with one name. Do you guys know how to say the actor's name that played Leroy? Is it Tymac? I think it's Tameek. Uh, Tameek? That's what I thought. I, I have no idea. We're just going to go I, with... I, I'll go with either one, but I was, I thought it was Ty Mac, but... Okay. Well, that's two to one. Ty All Mac. right. I lose. <laughs> I'm out. All right. So Ty Mac Vanity uh, was also... Uh, it's Denise Matthews, but she was going by Vanity at the time because of her music career. And then Chris Murney and Julius Carey are also in this movie. And it was actually, compared to some of the movies we've talked about, a box office success, you guys. This movie grossed thirty-three million dollars against a ten million dollar budget, so it was it was not a bomb, but it was a big time critical failure. The critics destroyed this movie. They came out and they were like, "This is one of the worst movies ever made." So there there is a huge target audience for this movie, Mm -hmm. and it's not the people sitting around talking about it right now, right? Um, <laughs> I thought you were going to say it's not the it's not movie critics, which I I would agree with you. This is a movie for the common people, <laughs> right? So I mean, you got you got Barry Gordy attached to it, right? It's it's you know set in Harlem. Mm-hmm. It's kung fu, which I mean, if you guys are familiar with the Wu Tang at all, you, you know that back in the day that that's that was very popular with the with the, with black audiences. So yes. like that that was that that was the chief target audience here obviously well yeah and then they knew what they were talking about because like i said it made a lot of money for this type of movie this type of budget well and i feel like it influenced a lot of even the people that we grew up with in the 90s i mean look at buster rhymes i mean he put Mm -hmm. a whole video out where he pretty much spoofs show enough right and then even well little thing i caught i think they definitely influenced the waynes brothers as well you think Uh, so well show enough always does the he says, I'm trying to think of the line. Uh, who's I, the baddest? I, I can't hear you. Oh. Damon Wayans does the same thing in Major Pain where he's like, I can't hit you. Oh. And Show Enough says that probably two or three times in the movie I asked, where at the end of his big oh, quotes. Right. Where they were answering him back. I Correct, got, yeah. I got kind of warrior vibes from, from his whole thing too. Yeah. And they, his little, him and his little gang seemed like a gang that would have fit into the, with the Warriors with all yeah. the, with all their football pads and nonsense, stupid crazy, <laughs> stupid craziness. Yeah. So let's talk about some of your guys' general overall impressions of the movie. So we, we've got one who's seen it before. Kurt, you had never seen it before. So let's start with Brady, if you if you can. What what just you watch this movie generally overall? What are your feelings about it? Is it the best movie ever made? It's no. <laughs> okay. Um, it's a, it's a great story. It's it's funny how all the people that have the most screen time are the worst actors. <laughs> accurate. Uh, very accurate. Um, but it's a very good popcorn movie. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, I could watch this movie every week. Yeah, okay. I was really on the fence at first about this movie. I think originally, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but we were going to do Gleaming the Cube. Yeah, well, that was the plan for this yeah. week, but we had to rearrange because we couldn't get it anywhere. When I, when I come into this, I come in very... I guess subjectively, is that the right word? Mm-hmm. So I come in going, you know what? I, if I'm not, if I haven't seen a movie, I'm going to want to watch it and, and see what it's about. So Gleaming the Cube did not sort of hit, like resonate with me. I was kind of like, I never skated as a kid. I hung out with skaters. It wasn't a big deal. But I was like, I'll give it a shot. Mm-hmm. But when that fell through, I was excited for this movie. Oh, all right. And so after watching it with you and the good times we had watching it and laughing and realizing that that's what moving going is all about. Three buds going to a movie, checking out the movie, laughing, talking about it, quoting it. I feel like that's what we did. We laughed about it. We made fun of it. We had a really good time talking about it. So ultimately, I love this movie. 
Yeah, I agree, man. I think movie going is communal, and and that's why I think people, you know, love love to sit on the couch with their loved ones if they if they have nothing to do on a certain night, and they're like, hey, let's do a movie. Hey, let's go to a movie. Let's get together with friends. Let's go to a movie. Like, movies can be enjoyed on your own, right? But, I, man, it's always more fun when you do it with other people. So I'm going to say I really I really enjoyed Brady's pick this yeah. week. I thought it was a good time. It was a good draft pick, Brady. I, I did enjoy it. I Afterwards, as ridiculous, I mean, cutting through all the cheese and everything, I was like, I would definitely watch this movie again, which I can't say about the majority of the movies we talk about. It's right. It's weird. Just as a movie goes, looking at it as a film, it's like they had half of a script for like a Motown musical and half of a martial arts script, and they just jammed them together, right? And they just did a quick <laughs> shuffle. Like a deck of cards? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and because from one page to the next, it just goes back and forth, and you get a little bit of whiplash. And so that's something I've never experienced before. Every scene, it was like, Okay, now we're in a different movie, right? I mean, how many times did I say that while we were watching? Yeah, it, you're right? like, what? Are, what? What is happening now? Why now, is this? Now we're in a family drama. Now we're in a musical. Now we're in a martial arts movie. And, and even the even the studio had no idea how to explain this movie. You know how most posters have like a tagline on them. Sure. Okay, I love talking about taglines because they're always so stupid. The tagline for this movie that was on the posters is the longest tagline I've ever seen for a film. They felt like they had to say everything about this movie to get people to understand what it is. So this is, I'm going to read this to you guys. The tagline is ridiculous. This is legitimate. He's a martial arts master who refuses to fight. He's a Bruce Lee fan who's so sure he's oriental that he eats popcorn with chopsticks. His friends think he's too serious. His family thinks he's crazy, but his enemies think he's no challenge, but he knows he's the last dragon. That's the that is seven sentences. The, it's a very <laughs> accurate tagline, though. However, I know, but they're just like just literally. First of all, he doesn't know he's the last dragon. That's the point of the entire movie is that he doesn't know. Yeah, the tagline should not be an entire paragraph. No, it should not. This is like the back of the DVD, but they put it on the movie right. poster. <laughs> Honestly. It's pretty bad. It's supposed to just be a little teaser just to give you an idea. How would you, how would you re, 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 re how do I say this? Rewrite, <laughs> rewrite the tagline? Yeah. Hmm. I would say old Jewish guy <laughs> 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 wants his girlfriend on this TV show, but he, but he doesn't have the moves. Get the man a paintbrush. He's the last dragon. Get the man a paintbrush. Awesome. There you go. That's, That's so better. <laughs> I would have just gone with who's the master and yeah. left, it, left it there. Right. I, I Honestly, it would be something about like the showdown for Harlem begins and, and or something like that, right? Like yeah. who's the master Simple. is perfect. Like something. But <laughs> this That's funny. is just not what happened here. Little Jewish guy. Oh, Mr. Arcadia. I can't wait to talk about him. Let's get into the movie. Let's just let's just dive straight into this film, okay? And, and talk about yeah. some of the scenes, some of the scenes that we got to talk about the best. And, and I mean, the movie starts off. With an insane training sequence, right? Do yeah. you remember this? It's first of all, it's just like a music video. There's like three parts of the movie where it's just like a music video because these are people that made music videos. Sure, he's just like boxing in the air and right, kind of sure. like kind of like Cool as Ice was made by a guy that made music videos, and so the whole thing starts off like that. And we get this training sequence where this guy keeps trying to shoot arrows at our hero. Yeah, Mister Miyagi with a push broom mustache. Yeah, the guy that's in like two scenes in this whole movie, right? Right. He's catching arrows. He's chopping them midair. He's doing something to a wooden dummy that's not martial arts, but he's slapping it around. Okay. So we, we know right away who the hero is and like, okay, we, we understand this, right? This is the guy's trainer. This is, as you said, the Mr. Miyagi. And here we go. And they immediately start to spout this like mystic mumbo jumbo BS about the ultimate master that he's got to go find the glow. I mean, like all of this nonsense, right? The glows, by the way, is like you need to have the glow. I'm like, it sounds like an alien STD. Okay, I don't. It's it sounds like something like, hey man, I got the glow, soul glow. Right. And, and can, can we talk about the 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 immediate joke here? Yes. Of who he's got to seek out. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> you mean all yeah, oh, the 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 some dumb the ultimate guy. master? <laughs> some dumb goy, right? Yeah, some dumb goy, right? Which is just you know Jewish for non-Jew, right? Right. <laughs> right. So some dumb guy. I mean, wait. So you're saying his master was Jewish? 
possibly. It doesn't does it matter? Well, I think it, I think it does because I think it'd be the first martial arts movie of all time where the the guy's sensei is Jewish. Let's just say, for the sake of argument, he is. History but was made, made here in 1985, folks. <laughs> Don't bury the lead. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, he picks the fortune cookie company name, which is obviously a joke. Yes. But let, let's be honest. This is a this is a three amigos joke. You know, when mm. they go to the bar at the beginning of the movie, and it's 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 called the the three drunkards or whatever the what whatever the movie. Oh right, yeah. Uh, you know, this is a this is a writer's joke, but it's not hidden very well. No, and and so right because we we know it ultimately ends up being a, a basically he's pranking his student here, and there is no master, and he basically says go find some dumb goy, and go to this fortune cookie factory. And he's like, he, here's here's a medal that used to b- belong to Bruce Lee. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. With like later on, he's like, psych, it's a belt buckle," <laughs> and just it basically trolls trolls this kid and makes him waste the entire movie going after something that isn't real, right? Because there is no master, right. and this dude immediately is set up to look like a moron. Well, let's be honest the the character is not the brightest bulb in the crayon box. No, but did they write it that way, or did that just how it came across? Because this guy is the worst actor in this movie. The everything he says is like a robot. Well, we were talking about that. We were saying yeah. that he's like small wonder, <laughs> and he probably goes back to the corner and he gets plugged in and shuts down for the night. Right, like like I think you'd said you wanted to see at the end his like chest open up and you realize that he was a robot the whole yeah. time. I mean, it was just like every line of dialogue was delivered so robotically. I wonder if that was a choice or if that was just, we got to do this because of who we have. I think they were going for like a Zen master, like, you know, the river is ever flowing towards the horizon. You know know what I mean? Okay. But the the guy's obsessed with Bruce Lee and he wants to be Bruce Lee. And Bruce Lee had personality, right? I mean, he's supposed to be Bruce Lee is my, is what I take. I mean, his name is Bruce Leroy Green. Yeah. He even um, wears a jumpsuit that Bruce Lee wore in a movie one time. Oh, yeah, the yellow-black yeah. one. Yeah. Let's, let's just get this I, uncomfortable thing out of the way. Yeah, let's go. He thinks he's Asian. Pretty, yeah. I mean, the tagline I mean, even said he thinks he's Asian. Yeah, that's the plot point. And there's, there's actually a lot of, you know, they would not use the same terminology uh, if they made this movie today. <laughs> no. There's a lot of that. The dude walks out of this training session with, like, a traditional Chinese, like, headwear. headwear. Yeah, like he's about uh, to go out to hat. the rice field. Like, the bamboo hat. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, right? right yeah. And he's, like, walking through Chinatown in a bamboo hat. As And I'm like, bro. And nobody looks at him at all and is like, what is this cat I'm like, doing? dude, this is not okay. To be fair, it's New York City, right? So they see weird all the time. I suppose that's true. I just think it's funny that nobody reacts to him at all. Not at all. Walking through the subway and the... Everybody in Harlem no sells this 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 African American walking around dressed up like he's like you said going to the rice yeah. fields. They're like, oh no no, that's that's Bruce Leroy. We all and, know and, that's Lee. okay. That's yeah, Leroy Green Junior. Bruce Leroy. So, can we go to the scene where they're all having breakfast? Yeah. Oh, you mean when yeah, we so, find out his dad is Black Clint Howard? Right. <laughs> and and it's like they're having this conversation about his behavior for the first time. Yes. Like he hasn't been doing this for years. This is just something he started <laughs> right. like a minute before the movie started. Yes. He it, like immediately as soon as they cut in, that was actually his first training session with that guy when he was catching arrows. And <laughs> it's just a new thing he's into. It's, you know, mom, I'm a, I'm a samurai now. You just have to go with, you know, he's like, okay, well, last week he was a cowboy, but we're going <laughs> to, we're just going to go along with it because Leroy's special. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is so it is almost like that. And 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 yeah. speaking of his family, every mo- every scene they're just introducing new characters, like all the way through the entire movie, all the way to the end. Like, oh, he has yes. a family now, <laughs> right? Um, uh, what's her name? Rudy Huxtable. Rudy his Huxtable little... is his little sister. Yeah, and and, right. and honestly, no, all joking aside, when that family came on screen, I, I had to rewind it. I was like, that guy looks exactly like the black version of Clint Howard. You guys, if you don't know who Clint Howard is, it's uh, Ron Howard's little brother or big brother. I don't know if it could be his older brother, but he's in all of Ron Howard's movies. Yeah, okay? absolutely. It's like fine Clint Howard. Yes. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah, he's not nowhere near like, I don't want to disrespect the guy and say he looks too. Yeah. I mean, cause, yeah, famously and it's ugly. It's not just nepotism. He's Clint in Howard. a lot of other movies. Right. Sorry, he's, Brady. He's a wonderful character actor. He is. Yeah. Clint Howard is, yes. He's, right. He always gets the Will Patton Award. Oh, probably. Oh, we haven't done a movie yeah, with Clint much. Howard yet in it, I don't think. Not yet. Well, we got to do a Ron Howard movie. 
All right, so can we talk about Not this? necessarily. Anyway. <laughs> I don't know if there's a Ron Howard movie that qualifies. I'd have to go back. I'm sure everyone makes a turd now and then, but I have yeah. to go back and look. Can we talk about the scene where Leroy, well, I think this is right after that, after he walks out of the place, when they go to the movie theater to watch. The, I love the movie theater scene. The Bruce Lee yeah. movie in the theater where every right. 80s stereotype is in attendance. It's fantastic. <laughs> In the middle of the day. In the middle of the day. They're like, they have everybody represented. Like, you have to be dressed up as a stereotype to get in, right? They're like, okay, no, I'm sorry. We already have hard hat guy. We need. We, we already need, have cross dresser. We, we got cross dresser. Oh, yeah. no, we need uh, 80s break dancers. Okay, you guys can come in, right? Like, yeah. it was ridiculous. Village people are already here. <laughs> Village people are already here. Every, the one thing I did like about the movie is be, it was a very diverse cast. And so especially for the time it forced them because of the story they're trying to tell to cast outside of the Hollywood, you know, norm usual suspects. Yeah. Right. You ended up with a cast that was very diverse and I appreciated that. And this no more. So in this scene, when they get that dude that comes out and just stomps on the, on the, uh, the jam box. Well, and he mimics, <laughs> he mimics Bruce Lee. I mean, right. that's the best part because right. they're watching this Bruce Lee movie. And they splice in the Bruce Lee movie with him jumping up and smashing the radio or the stereo or whatever. You Everyone's hooting and hollering. Has there anyone ever gone to a movie theater where there's people break dancing in the aisles? Is this how it was in the 80s? I feel like this is an exaggeration. In New York, possibly. <laughs> I don't know. I, again, I think we're the wrong people to ask. Okay. The, the, my favorite part of this, though, is, is the total and complete lack of setup where sh this is when Shogun shows Shogun. This is when Shonuff shows up for the first time. That's hard to say. Show enough shows up. Show enough shows up. <laughs> um, show enough shows up. There's, there's no show setup. Guns of Harlem. That's right. There's no setup at all. They're just like, ah, I'm the bad guy, and we're tired of you because you're the good guy, and we're going to fight now. And th that's it. Well, and there's, you know, <laughs> the other thing that cracks me up, too, about those movie theaters, there's like little kids in there. You know, <laughs> and that's show enough picks that one up, and he's just like, what you say to me? You know, and he's like, <laughs> And he's like, who's, who's tougher than me? That's and he's right. like, ah, Bruce Leroy. And, then, Blue. and he doesn't, he's not reacting. He's no, just, he's he just eating his popcorn, popcorn. With his chopsticks. Like, <laughs> there isn't some bad guy that just entered in. It's like, no, right. no, I got to watch this movie. You know what this is like, though? This is like, you guys ever play the South Park games, Stick of Truth or Fractured Butthole? <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, yeah. There, there's these, uh, they're basically like just decided that day to play Lord of the Rings or they decided to play superheroes that day. And so they're all kind of just playing along and that's is the, you know, they're fourth graders and this is the, gotcha. this is the game. And if, if, if going with Brady's theory is true and he just decided to be uh, Bruce Leroy, the, the uh, martial artist today, it's like show enough is just his friend that showed up also dressed up to play karate fights and he's <laughs> got his like dad's hockey pads on. Right. Yeah. And he's like, I am the Shogun of Harlem. Because how do they already know each other? And his sweet visor shades. Yeah, right. It's fun. it's it's almost like Mr. T breaks in and just like, let me explain the plot to you, suckers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but Mr. T was not famous at this point because, like, what was it Rocky Three? Yeah, come out yet? Um, yeah. no, it had just come out like the year before. I want to okay. say it was like eighty four, maybe eighty three. They yeah. probably tried to get him on this movie, and he wouldn't do it. I'm guessing. Well, let's talk about Julius yeah. Carey, because Julius Carey, the guy that played Show Enough, now this is his big entrance here. What did you think of, of that character and that performance? Here's the thing. like Against these signal name people who act poorly, mm -hmm. um, he looks amazing. Yeah. Um, but I, I, the one thing that makes it for me that, that it, it's, it's not just like an overblown thing and it's an actual performance is when they're at the pizza place, and he says something, and the the two uh, guys are like, "Show enough, right?" But he, it's obvious that he didn't want that reaction at that point. He was actually speaking and not just right. I, I think that's that made it for me doing his rhetoric. Yeah, the way it gave some yeah. depth to what he's doing. I actually was listening to an interview yesterday with Time Act uh, retrospective, him talking about the movie, and uh, he he said some pretty interesting things about Julius and. I, the guy's almost six foot seven, so big, tall guy, but he's built like a basketball player, right? Like he didn't have sure he wasn't like physically imposing. He was actually very, very skinny and uh, didn't have big shoulders or one of these big, you know, like bodybuilder looking dudes. And so that's why they put all the pads and stuff on him was to right. make him look more physically imposing. But besides all that, he said, "Well, 
what I can't do physically, I'm going to do with my performance. I'm going to be, I'm going to make it feel like I'm physically imposing just by my presence and, you know, how I deliver these lines and how I perform this character. And I think he was very menacing and I don't, I think it played and you, and he overcame whatever physical limitations he had. Well, and the, I guess my input on this is um, after watching it with my kid, we were going over and she's a huge Batman fan. So I looked at it from that standpoint last night. And as much as you don't want to look at the last dragon as Leroy as Batman, mm-hmm. I do feel that his villains are very, they represent what Batman's villains are. So you have these two villains whose one's very maniacal and over the top. And as we said, always dialed in at 11. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But then you've got Show Enough, who's kind of like that side bad guy who is also just as menacing, but without being necessarily a, an 11, mm-hmm. but still very close to that, but done better mm-hmm. than how Arcadian's villain was. Oh my gosh, much more nuance. So to me, it was very cool to see the bad guys with their group of you know cronies and thugs and guys to do their bidding, mm-hmm. but then they were so different. Mm-hmm. So it'd be like having Two-Face and Joker, yeah. who are just totally two different villains and i i love that about this movie yeah and i thought show enough was by far my favorite character in the movie wow and i i just i enjoyed who he was and and what he brought to the table in the in the movie itself i agree i just i'm surprised that i just referenced a nuanced performance about a guy named show enough wearing football pads in a karate movie but it's true <laughs> without show enough this movie is a stinker. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so kudos to Julius Carey. Just wanted to take a second to talk about his performance because I thought he really. I mean, everybody. Rem- I'm assuming everybody that went and saw this movie remembered that character probably more and above anybody else. So good for him. And 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 now on to a totally different movie because we're switching scenes. And this was talk about Whiplash. The movie starts off with this. Okay, this is a karate movie. By the time you get done with the movie theater. You're like, this whole thing's going to lead up to a kung fu fight between these two people. And then it on a dime, it turns, and you're in a music video with Vanity or Laura Thomas right. or whatever her name is in this movie. Yeah, right? Laura. And it's you're, I was just sitting there going, what happened? What movie am I watching now? Who is this? Because they don't, they don't explain why we're no. suddenly watching this person. Coming you know, out of the ceiling. Coming out of the ceiling yeah. or whatever. You're just like, okay, I guess we're watching this music video. Like to take a break from all the karate hijinks. But man, her performance, I, f- I felt bad because Bob's not here and I'm like taking his thing. But man, she seemed like she was definitely coked out of her mind while she made this movie, especially during I, the performance. I wouldn't doubt that. No. What do you think the weed budget was on this movie? <laughs> 30 <laughs> Thirty dollars, no, thousand. Oh, I don't, I don't know what weed costs. I mean, my God, her her eyes. She she just was like, looked like her eyes were gonna pop out of her head while she was singing and dancing, and it was just it just an insane performance. Well, and again, I think the eighties was filled with movies where everything had like we were saying again to reiterate, dialed up to an eleven. Yeah. So I don't know if the director was just like. Hey, we got to see you having a good time and trying to sing. And I mean, it just felt very overacting. Yeah. Well, sometimes you do that to cover up a bad actor, right? You just say, well, just go big because sure. You know, they don't know what they're doing. I don't know. I, I felt like there were scenes where she was more subdued, uh, where she actually gave a pretty good performance overall. I don't think she did a bad job, but I was speaking specifically about when she was singing and, do, and doing that musical performance, which is weird because she was a musician. I found out a pop star, a part of a girl group called Vanity Six. So she should have been something that should have been the part where she was very comfortable. Sure. And, and experienced very, it seemed awkward. very awkward and yeah. uncomfortable. Like she was an actress trying to play a pop star. Yeah. It didn't know how to do it. What did you guys think of vanity in this movie? I thought she was pretty. I thought, you know, for the time period, I guess the, the outfits were pretty over the top and, mm-hmm. and crazy. Um, but that was pretty much anything in the eighties really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, look at all of Angie's outfits. Those were all ridiculous, and she's oh got gosh. plexiglass in her hair and everything <laughs> else. But, no, um, uh, you know, she had to play over the top, so I felt like there's 
could have been a more serious tone to mm-hmm. her, mm-hmm. and I think she could have pulled it off had they had went that that route. But unfortunately, that is what it is. And um, I I thought she did a, at least a decent job. Yeah, definitely better actor than uh, Ty Mac. Yeah, than than uh, Lee oh, yeah. Roy. I think they had the chemistry yeah, like, of a wet mop. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, same. I mean, <laughs> I think the only reason her performance looks decent is the fact that. She's playing against this Time Act guy. Um, <laughs> just any one of the three of us could do a better job than he did. Well, let except me, for with the kung fu stuff. Yes. Yeah. Let me take this even a step further because this is going to bother you even more. As terrible <laughs> as this guy was, okay. And this first scene, when when we see, let me back up a little bit before I get into that. The first time they come together is kind of right after her performance, and I think in general to give some positive positivity to her performance. She did nail like the vibe of like an alpha female. I thought she at least had that was believable, right? That she was a powerful like pop star in the music business. Yes, I'll agree right? with that. And sure. so that was good. But this first time they meet, this is, oh, by the way, big time trope. He just happens to be walking down the sidewalk at the exact time she comes out and they just, their eyes lock eyes, and, yeah. and they're immediately like, oh, I like you. Oh, let me give you a little right. wink. Any of this, anytime, well, same thing with the TV thing and all these episodes where they find out things randomly because they're watching TV at the right time. It's just lazy writing whenever you're like, I don't just randomly have them walk by each other. It's like, it takes away character agency. Uh, you know, anytime it's instead of like, it's a result of a choice that somebody made. It's just, I hate it. And they do this stuff all the time. And so they're walking up, they see each other. She's trying to sign autographs or I don't know if it was the press was asking her questions or whatever it was. She's got the paparazzi. Yeah, they're breaking through the people, yeah. To get in this car, which turns out to be owned by Mr. Arcadia and a bunch of bad guys in yeah. the car that are going to kidnap her, which we'll get to that Arcadia's plot line in a second. But, but he essentially rescues her again because he happens to be walking down the street. Sure. <laughs> right. This is the moment when his acting, I think, really started to be bad or really started to show itself as awful because before that he wasn't saying much. It was mostly him doing karate stuff. Sure. But my goodness, whatever he started saying, he was like, I will help you. It was like, I almost sounded like Arnold a little bit, but it was just like, it was terrible. And I remember sitting there thinking, they could have had Wesley Snipes in this movie. Do you know Wesley Snipes pushed hard for this part? You know who else auditioned for this? Lawrence Fishburne. We could have had Cowboy Curtis. Yes. Or Morpheus from the Matrix movies. But it gets even worse. Oh, it gets worse, Brady. Oh, yeah, I know the list. You know the list? Yes. Please Denzel continue. Washington. Denzel Washington auditioned for this movie, and they went with this guy. This, do you line those four people up in a room? You have them all give an audition, and you end up with Ty Mac? Well, they had the budget for weed. <laughs> Here's the thing. Nobody knows who any of those people are at this point. May, but, maybe Cowboy Curtis, right? Um, but, through Pee Wee Herman. I, yeah, I don't absolutely. know where we're at the timeline. But nobody knew who Ty Mac was either. And so it yeah, had to have just been could, on their merits. He could do Kung Fu, man. Bro, I don't know what he was doing. I mean, Wesley Snipes, Wesley Snipes was, was yeah. pretty amazing. So, And he was uh, actually a martial artist, too, because he had a background in that stuff. Wow. Well, so, yeah, they, they screwed up. They should have gotten Wesley Snipes then. I mean, honestly, ma- imagine All this day. movie with Denzel Washington in it. Now you're taking it into the stratosphere, bro. Well, maybe on yeah. an acting standpoint. But yes, I'm, I'm certainly from an acting standpoint. I'm also agreeing with Brady in the fact that, you know, if he was already a martial wow. artist, would that have sold? You don't think Denzel can throw a kick to some fool's face if he has? I mean, he's like the type of guy that learns what he's got to learn, and he's like a chameleon, and he would have done it. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell it. I can't believe I have to prove why Denzel Washington would have been better than Ty Mac I've in this movie. I've seen one Denzel yeah, this Washington is- movie, and I don't even know if I can remember the name of it. Is it glory? What? Is it glory? Glory's the only that's Denzel the, Washington yeah. movie you've and, seen? Really? Yeah, and I had to watch it because of school. Really? And, yeah, that's it. I've never seen wow. any other Denzel Washington you movie. You haven't seen The Equalizer? Nope. You haven't seen Man on Fire? No. You haven't, you haven't seen Training Day? Nope. You have to Sorry. see Training Day. Remember the Titans? No. I, sports isn't my thing, man. If Ty Mac was in here right now, <laughs> he would, I'd ask he him would to, judo, chop to judo chop you right in the neck. <laughs> He said, okay, but, but I will do thing. that. I will do that for you. <laughs> We're planning this movie. It's 1984 because, yes. you know, the movie comes out in 85. Nobody knows who any of these people are. 
Right. So that's why I feel like it had to come down to what they could do in an audition. And you tell me they can't beat him out in an audition? Maybe not 1984. <laughs> Bro, you think even in 1984 that he was acting better than Denzel was? Probably not, but he could, <laughs> he could kick you in, in your, you know, the top of your head. Oh, my gosh. I without just. Without moving. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll get off of this. I will, we have to move on. We have to move on. But I just, I saw that and I almost had a, a you connection. You like a vein was going to pop in your forehead yes. just now. Like Lawrence Fishburne, Wesley Snipes, and Denzel watching and we ended up with this clown. How come we can't see those three in a movie? Right? I probably wouldn't watch it. Let's be real. Oh, <laughs> do a remake of The Three Amigos. Let's do it. If Denzel Washington's in it, you wouldn't watch yeah, it. Yeah, no, I wouldn't You've only it. been eva- eva- yeah. evading the greatest actor of our time. It's all good. I'm gonna, I'm, I've got to show you every Denzel Washington movie that exists now. You're going to have to. And I'm going to have to do it in our pre time because none of them are bad enough to be on this podcast. So, you know. Agreed. All right. All right. Well, let's Although talk. Maybe like Ricochet. May, uh, maybe. Uh, or, John oh. Goes in that as well. Yeah. Virtuosity. Oh, yeah. That's horrible. With uh, Russell Crowe. Yeah. That might be one we could do with Denzel. Add it to the list. That's right. All right. Well, let's before we get too far, let's talk about Mr. Arcadia because we've mentioned him a bunch of times and we haven't really talked about yes. him. Yes. So there's this insane plot line, like this other villain besides Shonuff, where he's basically got his girlfriend who is, you know, a poor person, Cindy Lauper, because they couldn't afford to get Cindy Lauper. And so Cindy Lauper is, right. you know, performed by uh, Justice Faith in this movie as Angelica. I think it's her name. Her name. Oh, Angela, maybe. Angela. And. Yeah. The whole plot of this guy, who we don't know, he's a he's a businessman. That's as vague as they get with this guy. We don't know who he is, where he got his money. And he wants to get his girlfriend's music video played on Vanity's TV show, which is basically like, I don't know what, like Soul Train? Or yeah. like mixed with American Bandstand. Like they show, you know, bands and music and dance and all this other stuff. And uh, she doesn't want to put her on because she thinks she sucks. And so they hatch this plot to like force her to – to get his girlfriend discovered. This is the whole plot line. Yeah. Can we talk about that song real oh, quick? Oh, Dirty Boys? D- yeah, Dirty Books. Or is it Dirty, is is it dirty found- Books? I thought it was Dirty Boys. Yeah, because she found them. She found them. Oh, um, my gosh. Yeah. But yes. could you make a more perfect bad song on purpose? <laughs> like, yeah, like the music catchy, people. But it's just horrible. Yeah. This is this is yeah. where you get you you you're right in the wheelhouse for the people that made this movie that have that background right. in the music business, right? They can they're so good at it, they can write a catchy tune that's also awful. Yeah. And that music video, <laughs> Brady, Kurt and I as we we're watching yeah. it, we're like, how how does a woman look at the same time twenty five and forty seven? I have no idea. She pulls it <laughs> off though. I gotta right? tell you. Yeah. Yeah. But my I think we like even the, Googled it, didn't we? We, we Googled it to see old how old she was. she was. And she was, what, 27? She's 27 years old in this movie. I'm like, there's no way. Yeah, there's some shots where it's just like, damn. And then there's some shots where it's just like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, like, lighting is so important <laughs> when you're making a film. Like, a- actresses and actors talk about this all the time where they, like, have to put a certain amount of trust into the – DP and the guys that are lighting it to make them look good because man, if you light things a certain way and shoot things a certain way, it's not flattering for people. Right. And so some of the, just a filmmaking standpoint, there's just some, it was clear that these guys were like music guys trying to make a movie. Well, I think it was very clear. That was basically the, the whole thrust behind Mr. Arcadia was here. My, my girlfriend made this terrible song called dirty books and we're going to get this, this piece of crap played. And so they kidnap vanity and, you know, force her to watch, Literally, like, grabbing her face and forcing her to watch. Yeah, this. like, they think by forcing her to watch this, she's going to go, oh, no, yeah, this is a great video. I didn't realize how fantastic right. this was. I need to put this on my show. And I mean, she's still like, no. She doesn't care. I'm not doing it. Even though even though she, she had a very, very manically upset William H. Macy tell her, nobody ever turns down Mr. Arcadia. I was like, <laughs> that was the most random cameo, by the way, in this movie. That was, like, the shoveler? <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's like, why is he in this movie? Because it, he's not done anything else. Right. So here yeah. I'm going to share with you as well, just to show <laughs> and reiterate how much I know about movies. I know him as the shoveler. 
I, I don't. The only reason that's that's relevant is because it's the only other William H Macy movie we've done. That's right. And the fact that I don't know anything else he's been in. Nothing else. And, well, other than I oh know he God. narrates uh, uh, Curious George. Oh but, my gosh, dude! But again, I—that's all I know. Like I just—that's yeah. just. You've never seen Fargo. No, I don't watch gosh. those movies. Shameless. Nope. That's a TV show. Oh, I've never seen. Yeah. Very popular yeah. TV show. All right. Well, but I know he's a good actor just yes. because of. Well, even in that, that one I, scene, he's in. I, he comes in and he's frantically telling her about Mr. Arcadia, yeah. and it's, he's like legitimately doing some good work. Right. In this one scene, I'm like, oh, oh, it's like a cup of water in the desert, right? Like good <laughs> acting. <laughs> No, don't leave us, William H. Macy. And we don't see him for the rest of the film. He's gone. No, just that one scene. <laughs> right. Out. Out. This movie just picks up plot points and drops them and never goes back all the time. Just just all the time. And, and, and never more apparent, like, with our guy, Mr. Arcadia, right? Because, like, what's in the green water? They never go back to it. Yeah, there's they, only, they drop they, it twice. They go back to it once. Yeah. Right. That's it. Because they'll show um, you what it is. There's no payoff ever. No. No. Well, no, they he, remember he dips his head in there. Right. But they don't ever they show you what it is still. Yeah. What is in this tank? Yeah. It's it's something worse than piranhas. That's he, right. And know. it's like dirty, murky green water. And right. the thing can can rip a pork chop or a pork loin off of them, off the bone in about four seconds. But then we never see it again after they dunks his head in it and it's just gone. I think I wrote something down about that, about how horrible it was, but also that it added some color mm-hmm. to the movie. Yes. Um, that was sorely needed. But then abandoned. Just like yeah, his, just like never, his. You never find out what it is. No. Yeah. It was abandoned, right. just like his hairpiece, which he <laughs> randomly right. wears in one scene, and then he's bald the rest of the movie. There's, do you remember this scene? Yes. He, so Mr. Arcadia's got like the horseshoe hairdo going on the entire film. Then in one random scene, he's got a hair, uh, toupee, and then the rest of the movie, he's bald again. And they don't mention anything. They don't say anything. It's just there, and then it's gone. Yeah, it's like they were in disguise to go talk to. Wasn't it shown enough when they were dropping the money for him? <laughs> it was kind I of a disguise. That's, as that. And that's what kills me because even like they show up, and then yeah. So he knows that he has a hairpiece then, because in the end they like team up in the yeah. in the uh, warehouse to to you know and he's bald yeah and it's like okay well, it's I like that was the me. first scene they shot and that's what they were gonna go with with his look for the movie and then they abandoned it but they didn't want to go back and reshoot that scene I, right. you know that's a great point I never would have thought of that this guy though let's talk can we talk about his performance Mr Arcadia as you've mentioned a couple times you know, dialed to 11, but I almost feel like that doesn't even do it justice. What's happening here. He's like a neurotic, uh, George Costanza. <laughs> <laughs> and considering how neurotic George Costanza Already is, that's, is, that's yeah. really saying something, <laughs> right? This guy, it's, it's like 11 doesn't justify it. It's like every scene, every facial expression, every line of dialogue, every reaction shot, everything. It's like, he said to himself, I am going to do this like a clinically insane person. And it's so over the top. It's so big. I, we got to go past 11. He's got this thing cranked to like 15. It's it's hilarious from an acting standpoint that the director just never stopped him. Maybe that's what he wanted. Maybe he wanted him so maniacal and so bizarre. That right. it, maybe he thought at that point that it it added to the movie. It's, it's, the, it's legitimately, and I'm not exaggerating, because I've seen tons of movies on this podcast and before, and I'll see a ton after. That was the craziest performance I've ever seen in a film ever. Yeah. Ever. I mean, there's times where he's just like almost like, like curly from the three stooges, (laughs) like pulling his hair out and like, I mean, it was just like, what? This is not a human person. This is not how people are. Like this is his interpretation. None whatsoever. It's, it's a total caricature. And so I apologize, Chris Murney. You probably thought, you probably looked at the script and you were like, all right, Kung Fu Harlem movie. I know exactly how I need to play this and I'm just going to go big. But there's going big and then there's Chris Murney big. I, I almost feel like I, we, I'm not going to, but maybe occasionally we can hand out the Chris Murney overacting award because this <laughs> this is that level yeah. to me. So are you adding a new a new award? I, well, not every I'm, movie I'm has a guy like this. <laughs> But if you ever watch a movie and we're coming on to do a show about it and there was somebody that 
is approaching Chris Murney level, you can give him the Chris Murney overacting award. Absolutely. Fantastic. I'm going to write that down. Oh, it's like Gurney, but with an M. A treasure he left us in 1985 that will be enjoyed for ages. <laughs> During the BMR. <Yeah. laughs> He's also got a Six Flags in his backyard. <laughs> Does he really? Oh, you made the Gurney reference. I'd, oh, you know. Gurney. Got yeah. it. Uh, that's such a, re- wah, that's wah, a regional wah, joke. The, uh... Yeah, it's such a regional joke. <laughs> oh, yay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Like six people will get it, but I appreciate it. Nice job. Cut. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, we got to get to the end of this movie. So, Do we? I will say this. Show enough did actually finally do something other than, like, I mean, most of the scenes he came in, or here's another random thing, like random plot points and characters introduced in every scene. Oh, look, Ty Mac has, a, or Leroy has a class that he teaches full of people that we didn't know, right? I thought he right. wasn't. A master. I didn't think he was a master, but he's got it told. And we are now teaching this class full of people that I will say introduced a character that I did like, which was uh, Glenn Eaton as Johnny Yu. Yes, that was. Yeah. He was very entertaining in this movie. He gave, and believable. Yeah, he gave a great performance. I'm like, yeah. Can yeah. we just can we just use him for the rest of the movie and just like I don't know, show enough like breaks uh, Leroy's legs and then he's got to take over the the quest because I could have watched the whole movie with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. That guy was great. And, and legitimately hilarious. But yeah. So anyway, show enough shows up. He shows up at the class. He try, makes him kiss his shoes. He, it, you know, for most movies, he just kind of randomly shows up. He's like, I'm going to get you sucker. And, uh, then eventually he finally does something villainous, something that I actually was like, okay, now you've made me like desire for the good guy to destroy you. Right. Which is when he destroys mom and dad's pizza shop was like legitimately awful thing to do. Right. I will tell you though, my favorite joke came from that, that mm. I made when we were watching it. Yeah. And that guy grabs those Parmesan cheese <laughs> and he squeezes them and they shatter in his hands. I think his name's beast. Yes. Uh, and I go, that's Thai cheesy right there. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Bro. I don't know, man. Like, one of my favorite lines is from that. It's uh, when he he does the high kick on the jukebox thing. Right. That is playing that really ho- that not. I don't think it's the same song, but it's a different horrible song from that lady. Yeah. Um, and the guy's just like, I don't own that. That's not even mine. You know? <laughs> That's like, great. Such a funny line. I think I think this movie had it been under a, maybe a more steady hand or a more nuanced hand. I mean it shouldn't have been a nuanced movie. It's about, you know, the Shogun of Harlem, right? So over the top right. is okay. I embrace that in a lot of films, but even, even here it's, it goes a little bit too far. If it had been reined in just slightly with some better performances or better casting decisions on a couple people show enough, I think would have been an even bigger deal because more people would have even seen this movie. And I think we probably would have got last dragon Two and maybe a whole series of last dragon movies. And it would have been awesome. I mean, this definitely had franchise potential. I'm, I'm, I'm sad that it kind of died out. Well, I mean, another scene I'd love to talk about yeah. is the bad guy tryouts. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe I forgot about the bad guy. Like, again, another random plot point yeah. introduced yeah. in the last minute. And then the guy with well, the one of the funniest things. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Well, and it, it, again, let's. It, it just reminded us of uh, Mystery Men. Where they were yes. having the good guy tryouts, you know, and it's just like all these bad guys showing up, and then it made for a pretty sweet fight at the uh, <laughs> when all these professional wrestlers just yes. show up out of nowhere to to fight the the karate school. I yeah. keep saying karate; they're not doing karate, kung fu, but still. And then you got kung fu Santa coming out <laughs> with the mohawk and the beard. That was like biker and they kung fu him. Santa. They pants him. Yeah, it was it was totally random. Let's talk about the final fight between everybody because this is when I, there was lots of cameos in this movie. Right. And so one of the things I appreciate well, we talked about William H Macy and Rudy from the Cosby show, Mike star. We haven't talked about the guy from dumb and dumber gas man. Oh yeah, absolutely. Was yeah, in this movie. I like to think that this is like the dumb and dumber is actually a sequel to this movie in, in, in some way. Yeah. That's, like, that's, that's his former character. life. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a great, that's my head cannon now for every time I watch this movie. That's great. Yeah. I would have never even thought of that. There was also the same guy, really. Oh, right. 
He's like, just some doofus that can't get his thumbs out of a briefcase. Yeah. Well, and he gets it yeah, smashed <laughs> in the money briefcase, right? The uh, There's also a very early in his career, I think it's only his second film, he was in the one scene where they kidnapped in the car. It's Chaz Palminteri, who's done a ton of like mob films. He was the, the cop that interviewed Kevin Spacey and Usual Suspects that did the interrogation. Yeah. You know, he was the driver in that car when Timac saved her from uh, that first kidnapping attempt. So there are all kinds of, and then, and then also the best cameo in the entire movie, which I thought it was just going to be a little popping, but then the, this kid like was part of the whole fight was Ernie Reyes Jr. was in right. this movie. I'm like, that's the kid from Surf Ninjas. And I was like, isn't that Raphael from Ninja Turtles? <laughs> yeah. And like, yes. He was like six years old, it looked like, in this movie. And he's flying around, yeah. kicking dudes in the face. And I think his dad is one of the, the bad guys. Yes, like he one is. of the, the line, lineup bad guys. Yes. In fact, that's one of the guys he gets into a fight with in the end is his dad. Yeah. And he, you can see the skills, like, even at a young age immediately. And this guy would go on. And like I mean, he's, er- like, triple kicking guys in the face. That's what I'm I saying. Mean, yeah, it was unreal. And he has to jump three feet in the air because they're all so much taller than him. But, you know, Ernie Reyes Jr. would have his big moment, like, in the early 90s where he's, you know, what Surf yeah. Ninjas was, what, like, 94 the turtle movies were a couple years before that, at least the first two. Yeah, ninety three, I thought. And he had a moment for a minute, and then I know he he's you know kind of faded from public view, and he was still working behind the scenes on stuff. But I love Ernie Reyes Jr. and I was so psyched when he showed up. Was it Surf Ninjas or was it like the Three Ninjas? Well, the Three Ninjas was the three white kids that right. like Colt, uh, Pony, and um, Bronco. I think that I think that was their names. Speaking of triple names that were hilarious, yeah. How about the three guys at the fortune cookie place? Bro, okay, so Brady, I've got to tell you how this happened because Kurt and I were dying, okay? We were wheezing. We were laughing so hard because they never mention these guys' names in the in the movie at all, okay? They never no, I do. have no idea what they are. Okay, the three rapping guys that were, like, talking about Sakatumi and, like, whatever that terrible right. rap song that, like, nothing rhymed, and it was awful. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're just like these three guys, and I, I knew you had to run and grab like a water out of the refrigerator or something. I yeah. remember why you stood up, but I paused the movie, and we're watching on Amazon Prime Video, and they have that X-ray feature that will show you who's in the scene and who's playing what character. The X-ray thing, right? And so we literally pause it, and Kurt comes back, and we look, and it says their their names on the screen, and we just start busting out laughing. What were their names? It was Hugh Yee. Louie and Dewey. It was Huey, Louie, and Dewey, but like the Asian spelling. I was like, are we watching? <laughs> are, we, like, are you freaking kidding are me? Are we watching DuckTales right now? What is going on? I, was, I couldn't believe they did that. And, <laughs> and that no one would ever know unless they looked at the cast list. I mean, in 1985, it was that's like, unless you watch the credits at the end. You're never gonna know that that's their names. Yeah, they, it was it was spelled H U Y I. Yes, and then it was L U Y I and D U Y I. Dewey, Dewey, and Louie. Talk about burying <sighs> the best joke in the entire movie. They buried it in the credits instead of just having it available for everyone to I'm, enjoy. I'm betting there was a scene left on the floor because they <laughs> thought it was a little bit too over, like it's too forced. You know yes. what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, we appreciate it. We do appreciate it. The other thing, before we get to our final segment, or our last two segments, I do want to bring up the final fight, the actual final fight that went down between Shonuff and Leroy Green, because I feel like we got to talk about some positive things. I actually really liked that final battle between the two of them and thought it was really well done. Until the glow. Up until the glow. (laughs) When the guy started glowing and he had this super dumb look on his face, like, ah, look at me, I'm glowing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, oh, I kind of ruined it. But I thought that was actually a really well done scene. It was well shot, well lit. The atmosphere was good. It was all good. I thought it was well done. I had a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun watching that. I thought, again, it was the only thing I thought was a little cheesy. And I know, again, probably a trope mm-hmm. was the whole Shona fights him. Yeah. And then Arcadian shows up and he's got a gun the whole oh, time. Yeah. So you. But just shoot him. If you have a gun, just shoot him. Yeah. But you got to wait. You got to wait till he's done fighting. I think the best piece of film that happens in this whole movie is when he's getting his head dunked. Um, Ty Mac yes. is getting his head dunked. And uh, they do the, the flashbacks. And it's got the, the 
the the water drip effect and it, you know for 85 that was it was really good effects and yes like just the editor bravo at that point yeah right that there. was actually really well done from a cinematic standpoint i agree with you yep. but ultimately he turns yellow and he defeats the bad guy saves the girl and then another big major trope happens after that the cops just show up for no reason. <laughs> right. I, I wrote that one down. Did you? Okay. Specifically. <laughs> well, and can I say, I didn't realize that your glow meter, you have a glow meter. You're not allowed. <laughs> yes. There's only so much glow you can use. Right. Because he runs out. <laughs> show enough has like, it's like sparking. Like, z- 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 <laughs> I'm like, oh, z- he's got to get a, a power up. He, he yeah. used all his glow. <laughs> and then how Here's- did... How did Timac, yeah. at Leroy Green, mm-hmm. he has not only yellow glow, yes. but he has sweet electrical powers as well. And he has blue, because when he, when he kicked the guy, it was blue, but his name is Green. Just a lot of bad choices happening. <laughs> <laughs> so I, here's the thing. Do all of those Street Fighter Mortal Kombat games like come out the same if this movie doesn't exist? You know what? I don't. I don't know. Man, that's really Sub Zero was in that final fight with all the. He, he was. I forgot <laughs> I was about like, that. As they're doing, I don't remember what any of the names were, but as they're circling around, showing all these people that showed up to fight, I was like, "Oh, Sub Zero, Christmas Grandpa," uh, <laughs> like they're going around, and but yeah, it was like a bunch of fighting game characters, basically. Yeah. You're yeah. right. So I, I don't think I think it definitely probably had an influence. Yeah, you got to power up your power up bar, and then you only have so much glow that you can use. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and so he waited to use his, his glow meter until the end, which is the smart way to do, conserve. Right. But, yeah. So let's, let's take a second here. And I know we've covered a lot, but if there's anything we didn't, now is the time. Because it's time to discuss the little things. There are some incredible little moments in this movie. Absolutely. <laughs> and there was one, Kurt, that you noticed <laughs> during the final fight that had me dying when uh, – uh, Ernie Reyes, or no, the the one uh, Johnny Yu finally used the nunchucks to defeat those three guys. Yeah, what was happening in the background behind him? Do you remember? <laughs> there was a guy. <laughs> there was a guy just laying on the ground, and he looks like a horrible salesman. <laughs> He's just and like an old a, guy in a suit. Yeah, and there's a ninja <laughs> with like a blowtorch, and the it's like a torch that you solder pipes together with, yeah. and it is on. But he's not burning him with it. No. He's beating him with the butt, like the blunt end yes. of the torch. He's and like, he just, I'm going to hit you with this. I'm going to hit I'm you with do this it. torch. And the whole guy's like, ah, ah, please don't it, do it. It looked like Eddie Murphy's character from the barbershop and coming to America, like yes. the old Jewish white guy that he played. Yeah. Randomly on the ground. getting. If you if you hadn't stopped me, I never would have saw it. No. And sometimes. <laughs> I'm always looking back. in the background. You go back and look. Always. It's right after he he gets those guys with the nunchucks, Johnny Yu. And oh my gosh, if you look in the background of fight scenes, especially in like big battles, like never, if you ever look past, like in Braveheart, the guys that are in the foreground doing the choreographed stuff to the extras in the background, they're like not even making contact most of the time. Right. And they're going like a quarter, uh, a quarter yeah, speed, they're like counting because One, it's more just like two, to fill three. in the frame. Yep. And have some motion going on behind them, but it's always one of my favorite things is to look in the background of those kind of big group fights to see what the extras are doing, which is usually nothing. And this is kind of one of those moments, except they put them too close to the camera. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Go back and watch. That was one of the best little things we found in the entire thing. I would also like to throw in there, yeah. and maybe this even falls into scenes, but af- uh, Laura... After mm-hmm. she tries to get Leroy to be her bodyguard. Yes. And then she takes him to this place and does this weird, like, Bruce Lee foreplay. <laughs> yes. Like, that counts. I don't, I am like. When she is... tries to seduce him with Bruce Lee. Yeah, and he is getting all sorts of excited with the videos. <laughs> it's like the the best acting I've seen out of him the yes. entire movie yeah. is when that's going on and he's got that dumbfounded <laughs> smile on his face. He's like, yeah. I'm liking this. Ooh, I like Bruce Lee movies too. Yeah, and she's and like, all right, I'm going to make my move. Here we go. <laughs> yep. And, uh, but he didn't have a paintbrush with him. <laughs> right. My other little thing was this running innuendo joke that he doesn't, well, he's asking for a friend about you, you need to have a paintbrush in order to make art, right? That he doesn't have the right moves to do. And I'm like, bro, this right. is the worst euphemism for this of all time. <laughs> And they went back to that well like three times in the movie. They, right. they even ended the movie on it. You show yeah, me it, some it, moves. 
Right. It was the, the, the button at the end. Right. right. Yeah. But uh, I, I love, we have not talked about the little brother at all. Yes. Who's the one who brought, brought up this concept. Well, we're talking right? about the little things, so this is perfect. Because he's a little right, person. Right, the, the little brother. <laughs> honestly, one of, one of the better actors in the movie. Yeah, he did well. He was good. And uh, he was annoying because th- th- this was another kind of tropey thing is after Shonuff tears up the pizza place and Leroy Green walks in, I'm like, watch, they're going to do that stupid trope where they're all mad at him even though he's not the one that destroyed their pizza place. And right. the little brother right on cue, this is because of you, man. <laughs> This is all your fault. This <laughs> is all your fault. Like, dude, I hate when they do that in these movies. Some other little things that I enjoy. Yes, give me another one. The lines that Arcadian oh, please. delivers sometimes. G- give me give me one. Are you ready? Yes. You let them order a la carte. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that was so and funny. He's later, just like, I'm gonna I was gonna be nice to you. Yep. I was gonna let you order a la carte. Yeah. <laughs> he, he brings it back. <laughs> Is he's like, you know these Hollywood types, you let them order out a cart. Oh, what the hell? Right. What the I paused the movie and wrote that down. <laughs> and then one of my other favorite lines is when uh, Angie's like, well, maybe she's tired. And then yes. he's like, she'll be dead tired if she doesn't work with us. You know, like, <laughs> like, what, so a, what a great 80s line. It's so stupid. I do think that. I was going to let you order a la carte is the best line in the movie. I agree. Yeah. It was pretty funny. Um, and one, one more little thing, at least for me, that I thought was totally randomly funny for no reason was when he when she left his, well, he didn't know it was a belt buckle, but he left his belt buckle in oh the car. Oh, my gosh, yes. And she, she, like, later on when he's over at her house, she gives it back to him, but she made it into <laughs> a necklace, necklace? Yeah. for him. <laughs> Like she, who finds something like, oh, look at this special thing this person left behind. I'm gonna make it into a necklace. <laughs> I'm gonna drill an eye hole in, the, in here and just run some uh, Olympic ribbon through here for you, honestly. Right. And then gives it back to him, and he's really like, oh, thank you. Right, I really. Like, she ruined it. This. Well, and then turns around and trips over a couch. Like that was Bruce Lee's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you ruined it. Well, who it knows? Into a necklace. I mean, that guy's a dirty liar. That's true. He told him that there was some master. Right. And then instead. He's like, psych, I got this at JC Penny. <laughs> yeah, I got this in the. Uh. So dumb. All right, guys, it's time to give this movie some awards. And so we're going to do our um, best to find the positive. And as I know, we ripped on a lot of this movie, but I liked this movie. I would definitely watch it again. I know you already watched it again. Oh, absolutely. I'll watch it again. And so this, this definitely yep. was a win for me, but. I do want to I do want to take some time and appreciate some people specifically. So we're going to start with our Will Patton Award, which is the award we give out to someone in a small role, but that is like really bringing the intensity uh, the entire time and, and really doing a great acting performance with very little. And so who would you guys nominate for the Will Patton Award? My vote is for Johnny Wu. Yeah. Because I think that he just did such an excellent job. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen a movie based around him. And I'm kind of sad that I haven't seen anything else with him. He was great. Physicality was great. Comedy was great. Acting, all that stuff. How about for you, Brady? Yep. We're talking about Glenn Eaton, right? Yeah, Glenn Eaton. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I'm I'm good with that. That's literally who I have down, too. We have our unanimous decision wow. here. Is that first ever I don't know if it's the BMR history? Well, we usually have four or five people, so I don't know yeah. if that's... I'd be really impressed if we ever get a unanimous one when everybody's it's in here. It's a clean sweep. But, yeah, for us today, a clean sweep. Glenn Eaton wins yeah. the Will Patton Award. Good job, Glenn. And uh, we also have our Trash Can Full of Dirt Award <laughs> to give out. And so, for me, the, the Trash Can Full of Dirt Award goes to... I, I don't know the guy's name because it was not readily available in the credits, but it was one of Shonuff's right hand guys. There was like the one guy that was super intense. I think you mentioned him. Yes. What was his name? Beast. Beast. Then there was the white guy. And then there was the third one that always looked confused as to whether or not he was in a movie or what was happening at any given <laughs> point. <laughs> and, and that guy, that guy's part could have been played by a trash can full of dirt. So he gets my trash can full of dirt award. That's Cyclone. I believe Cyclone? that's the, the Andy Samberg lookalike. Cyclone gets it then. Nice. All nice. right. Trash can full of dirt award. I, g- I gave mine a tie back. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought the whole acting was so bad. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry, but. A trash can full of dirt can't do those kicks, but it delivers the lines about as well. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I agree. You could just, you know, with CGI have the, the, the trash can flap when he's talking <laughs> and, you know, jump up in the air and like kick him in the face. <laughs> can you imagine showing up rolls into the movie theater? He's like talking to a trash can full of dirt. I heard about you. I'm coming to get you. And at the end, they have a fight. There's a whole glow <laughs> yeah. scene. Sorry. Hey, Brady, oh, you got man. somebody for the trash can full of dirt award. Yeah, I'm with Kurt. Like, All right. <laughs> could, you, you could replace him. Okay, fair enough. Fair well, enough. Would you replace him with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Um, ooh. I, ooh. Could you imagine this movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger as, uh, well, he could have played the part that the gas man played, oh, right? That, yeah, sure. He could have been, well, he could have been shown off because it's a Harlem movie, yeah, right? No. So I'm like, there's only like, you know, three different white people in this Would movie. Would you make him Arcadia? Right. No, he couldn't be Mr. Arcadia. Maybe maybe Mike uh, Star, Mike Star, Mike Star. That's what I'm saying. Uh, gas yeah. man. So he could have played Mark, Mike okay. Star's part. There you go. Sorry. And then found a spot for him. The perfect. And he would have made this movie better. It works every time. See. Yeah. <laughs> Don't touch my fish. <laughs> <laughs> every and when he gets his thumb crushed, pulling in the, out a leg of lamb yeah. out of the out of the <laughs> fridge, and just like licks it before it sticks it in there. They could have had a fight. Then aren't I, I feel like at the end, Mike. Star should have fought or been part of the fight. He just didn't do anything at the end. And if yeah, it had for been, a guy who was supposed to be a prize yeah. fighter. And if it had been Arnold, that okay, no, the guy like kept setting up his old boxing career, and I'm like, okay, well, he's clearly going to be the guy that he fights at some point. Yeah. And it just never happened. But if I Arnold mean, had what, been in it, what great '80s trope would have that been? That yeah. he would have set that up and then came in like a video game. That's right. And been one of the final bosses, right, with his swollen thumbs. <laughs> yeah. I'll crush you with my thumbs. Let's go. <laughs> Um. <laughs> all right. So our top three performances. Top <laughs> three. <laughs> Kurt, you gotta, you gotta pull it together. To do the top, top Sorry, three. I apologize. All right. So top three performances uh, from an acting standpoint in this movie. I'll kick us off. Uh, at number three, I had Vanity. Um, I think that, like I said, her aura, her energy, her vi- her general vibe was good. I don't know if what they gave her to do was a whole lot, but I think, yeah. you know, in a movie that's starved for great performances, she was number three. Number two, I gave to Julius Carey as show enough. I thought just to all around to, to make a menacing performance when you don't have necessarily the physicality and he hadn't done any, any martial arts training prior to this movie. Sure. I thought he pulled that all off very, very well. So kudos to him. He gets my number two spot. And then the best acting performance I actually thought was faith Prince as Angela in this movie. Um, I think the, the first, Two scenes, I was kind of making fun of her. She was a little over the top. But I think she was, that was even her character playing a part for her boyfriend. And then later on, when she actually kind of dropped the facade and had this great scene um, where she kind of tells him off and leaves. And then I get another scene with Johnny Yu at the back of the dojo where she actually legitimately delivers a touching performance in both of those scenes. And I, I thought she was great. So she gets my number one. So whoever wants to go next, who's your top three? So I went with um, brother at number three, the little brother. I oh, thought, yeah. I thought he did a really great job at, at portraying, you know, not only his little brother, but had some pretty good acting chops. Yeah, he was not a bad actor. Um, I went number two with Angie. Okay. Um, again, that like I agree with you with the speech at the end mm-hmm. where she's just giving that heartfelt you know, almost to where you kind of feel for her at that point. You absolutely do. And then number one, I went with Show Enough. Okay. Because I just felt as far as a, a, a sweet 80s villain. Yeah. I, I, he's great. He I is. I mean, he, I feel like he really, I think Brady said it earlier, you know, without without him, this movie is trash. No, he's he's far more important to the movie than Angela's character. I just was speaking from a specifically acting standpoint, but he's sure. definitely the best part of this movie. Yeah. So no one can argue with you there. What you got, Brady? I mine is similar to your guys' um, number three, show enough. Yep. I go go there. Uh, number two, the little brother. Okay. Which, which is a shame we don't remember his name. At yeah. All. I, um, some of these, when they don't have pictures on IMDb and there's a lot yeah. of just like silhouettes on there, it's hard for me to know who's who. Yeah. Exactly. And then, well, number one is uh, Angela Price because she just, yeah, from an acting standpoint, that's just the best yeah. right there. And let's be honest, if we didn't give um, 
Glenn Eaton the uh, Will Patton Award, he'd be in here somewhere. Yes, absolutely. 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 So there were there were some legitimately good performances. And if I hadn't given it to Glenn Eaton, I would have gave it to William H. Macy because even in his one scene, like I said, I was like, this is <laughs> – he stands out even more because it's such a desert of good performances. Uh, so right. another another kudos to him. Well, guys, we appreciate that you joined us here. If you could do us a favor – and be a friend, tell a friend, tell a friend about the podcast. We would definitely appreciate the word of mouth. You guys have been awesome. We love hearing back from you guys and, and people have been reaching out to the show. And we actually got uh, and we actually got a lot of great feedback this week uh, about the show. So we just want to take a second to just say how much we appreciate you. You've listened all the way to the end of the episode, which means you're awesome and slightly crazy. But, uh, you know, both of those things are good. So don't don't let anybody tell you anything different. We love you here at Bad Movies Rule. We thank you for listening and tune in next week where we are going to be talking about probably the longest movie we've ever covered on this podcast, which is Kevin Costner's The Postman. And uh, we're excited about that. And I'm actually going to go back and probably watch that tonight. And uh, I got to carve out a big chunk of time. Have you ever seen The Postman? No, I have not. I It's like Water Really? Road, Denzel Washington's right? not in it. No? No. Oh, that's probably uh, why I haven't seen it. Okay. <laughs> Brady, well, I know you've seen it. Is. That's right. And so we picked this movie, if you guys listen to the draft, because we had not yet had a Will Patton movie, even though we give out an award in his name. And so we'll be talking about The Postman. So tune into that. And we appreciate you guys. Thank you for listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day. For Kurt Mummer and Brady Cox, this is James Hauser. We'll see you next time. Will Patton almost has it turned up as high as Mr. Arcadia in The Postman, too, but uh, for some way he just pulls it off because he's Mr. He's Mr. 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 Uh, Mr. Postman? Mr. No. Patton? <laughs> Bring me a dream? No, I was going to say something else, but it just didn't work, and I'm too tired to go back and do it again. So thanks, guys. Sure. You got Print it. it. <laughs> <laughs>